I'm Dana Perino, and this is Perino on Politics. Vice President Harris closing the gap, but is it enough for her to come out on top in November? There is a long way to go. Welcome to Perino on Politics, where I call my smart friends and find out what's on their minds about the state of American politics. And joining me on the podcast today with a look at how things are heating up is a friend of mine. I'm so excited for you to meet him. His name's Michael Duncan. He is a founding partner of a very successful firm in D.C. called Cavalry LLC. He is a digital media expert. He's worked on many high-profile and successful campaigns, including that of Senator Mitch McConnell, as well as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Yahoo of Israel. And you also might recognize him because if you are a connoisseur of podcasts, as I am, he is a co-host of the Ruthless podcast. They have new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. And Michael, welcome to Perino on Politics. Thanks for having me. This is going to be great. So I saw you guys with the Ruthless booth at the RNC. And they were outside on the, on the square. I mean, you guys were super popular. I love seeing it. Yeah, I mean, could you get better real estate than that right there on the (laughs) plaza? Shows every single day. We had a blast and everyone was in such a good mood. You know, Republicans united for a change, which was nice. Um, And it was was right after the the failed assassination attempt of President Trump. I mean, the mood was insane. The energy was great. The unity was amazing. And in some ways, Michael, I feel like that was 10 years ago. Because Mm -hmm. I do think that the unity of the Republicans is just as strong at the end of the RNC as it is today. But what has changed since then is that Joe Biden has pulled out of running for the campaign. And immediately the Democrats were like, "Mm, should we have a primary? No, no, we're just going to go with Kamala Harris. And she is off and running on a sugar high honeymoon that the Democrats are quite enjoying right now. Let's get your take on where you think things are at this point, because the polls show we're still at pretty much a tie in the battleground states. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that's a reflection of the strength of Kamala Harris or really the weakness of Joe Biden. Historically bad numbers for Joe Biden among younger voters and minority voters. They're going to come back to the fold of the Democratic Party. We probably would have seen a lot of that in September or October as, uh, you know, you get closer to election day. But I think Kamala coming in because so many of those Democratic primary voters didn't want Joe Biden to be the nominee, half in some polls. Mm -hmm. There's a snapback now among amongst those cohorts, cohorts, the electorate, you know, the younger voters. And, you know, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a tied race. We should have anticipated this uh, as, you know, as a Republican. I did uh, certainly. Um, But. Look, I mean, the polls might look better for Kamala Harris right now, but the research book is a lot thicker on her than it is on Mm -hmm. Joe Biden. That's for sure. So one of the things I noticed in this um, chart that I look at, there's a substack that Bruce Melman does. I recommend it to everyone. Mm -hmm. And on Sundays, he does a thing called Six Chart Sundays. And he picks a theme and he runs you through six charts. And one of the charts he showed this week had two things. One was... Harris closing the enthusiasm gap. That was something I really looked to make me understand what was happening in in the election, because the enthusiasm for Republicans to vote for Trump was really high and enthusiasm for Democrats and Biden was very low. It is, according to this particular chart at this point, she kind of really shot up so that almost the enthusiasm uh, is about the same. But also, I wanted to ask you in particular about the fundraising. Uh, they mm-hmm. say that they've raised over $200 million and they have a lot of small donors and first time donors that might be younger people. And I know you pay a lot of attention to that. What do people need to know about the fundraising and enthusiasm gaps? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that is pent up demand, right? It's um, a lot of those voters who really were disappointed that Joe Biden was going to run again. Um, and they're coming off the sidelines for the first time. I mean, that being said, I mean, Donald Trump has the best small dollar fundraising uh, in the game. Um, So I anticipate he'll be able to keep up with whatever small dollar fundraising Kamala uh, can do here. But I do expect, you know, they're going to continue to have a a couple of good weeks here ahead of the convention Mm -hmm. uh, when she's formally um, 
you know, made the nominee. I don't think this is really going to settle out until after that convention, which really feels weird, you know, with so much of the electorate kind of unfamiliar with Kamala Harris and her policies and everything. Uh, But that's sort of where we are. We're 100 days out from an election. And, you know, there's a lot of voters whose minds could change. It's interesting because it does feel like Democrats feel and they're all a lot of them are saying unburdened by having to pretend that Biden was the perfect candidate for them this year. Um, He gave a weird speech last Wednesday night. We haven't had a podcast since last Wednesday night when the president addressed the nation. And, Michael, I wanted to love the speech. I wanted to say, good for you, sir. Way to land on, you know, way to stick the landing. And instead, he gave what was, to me, like a mini State of the Union speech. And then he said, oh, and also I'm going to do these six things before I leave office, including curing cancer and reforming the Supreme Court. Obviously, the cancer one is an important one to him, his moonshot that he wanted to do. But the reforming the Supreme Court, they got on that today. And Mm -hmm. this is a left wing idea that they want to go after the court. Now, if the court was filled with um, progressives, you can be sure that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden would not be wanting to reform the Supreme Court. This, I think, is going to be something that the funders of demand justice and the Arabella mm-hmm. network of advisors, right? These are the people, they have a lot of money. It goes to left-wing causes. There are money money that comes into right-wing causes as well. But in this one in particular, I almost feel like Joe Biden was like, fine, okay, you're asking for a return on investment. I will go forward and do this op-ed and say we have to basically reform the entire Supreme Court. One of the things he's doing is saying, after 51 years in public service, I now believe that 18 years is the limit for Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and I guess that starts now, Michael. Yeah, you know, um, it's funny you mentioned the State of the Union and how that speech in the Oval was sort of a mini State of the Union. He did the same thing back in that State of the Union, um, where he spent the, the middle of his speech uh, doing a, wef- a left-wing wish list, you know, to all of these interest groups. It's donor management, right? Like you, you mentioned, Arabella Advisors is, uh, you know, a billion-dollar enterprise that funds left-wing causes across the country. So I'm not, I'm not really surprised by it. It is, it is funny though that he rolls this out after he steps, steps down. Um, what I, what I find very interesting about these power plays that the left wants to do to change institutions, whether that's like make D.C. a state, get rid of the Electoral College, pack the Supreme Court, all these sort of things, is it's really situational ethics, depending on where they are in the political game. I would bet that if Republicans take the United States Senate here in November, suddenly they're not going to want to end the filibuster anymore. <laughs> right. And, and somebody that you used to work for, Mitch McConnell, warned them about this even before we ended up with the conservative justices that we have now. Yeah, shout out to Harry Reid, um, who was Senate Majority Leader, a Democrat under Barack Obama, who blew up the Senate filibuster for judicial nominations and paved the way for Mitch McConnell uh, and Donald Trump to fundamentally you know, transform the court with constitutionalist judges. <laughs> it wouldn't have been possible without what Harry Reid did. So, I mean, they will regret it if they try. <laughs> and... Let me also ask you about this, Michael. What do you think about the branding of Kamala Harris as a San Francisco liberal? How does that land in your messaging expertise? Um, I think it'll be successful just because there's so much research to back it up. You know, her her time, what's interesting is like her time in San Francisco, particularly when she was AG, um, wasn't as left wing as the campaign she ran in, in 2019 for president of the United States. Uh, but the book is is huge on everything from banning fracking, um, you know, to you know limiting red meat consumption. I mean, there, there's tons of stuff that's really far off the left side of the map um, that we have to educate voters for. Um, I mean, there's there's a ton of attacks, but it's going to require, I think, a a consistent effort by Trump, super PACs, Senate candidates to educate people about about her her record because. I mean, that presidential campaign, you remember, they all got on that debate stage and raised their hand and said, we're going to decriminalize border crossings, free health care for illegal immigrants. I mean, that stuff is toxic with 70, 70% of the electorate. The other thing I would note is that 
you know, while she's doing better with younger voters and African-American voters than Joe Biden was, the place where she struggled more than Joe Biden was with independent leaning Republicans, suburban voters, um, a, a part of the electorate that Donald Trump has seen a lot of slippage with, um, you know, since he came on the scene. And so that's also an opportunity, I think, to win back a lot of suburban voters, you know, in places like Bucks County, Pennsylvania, um, you know, Wayne County, uh, Oakland County in, in Michigan. I mean, there's there's a lot to get there based on her, her record. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I found very creepy and upsetting last week was you had entities like Wikipedia trying to erase history and in particular The fact that in March of 2021, President Biden tasked his vice president with overseeing the border. Full stop. Mm -hmm. And she didn't really want, I I think initially she was like, okay, great assignment. And then quickly realized this is an impossible situation and backed away from it. Then tried to say that it was only for root causes of the triangle countries. Um, But you had Wikipedia doing that. You had news organizations going back and editing online their very headlines in which they called her a border czar. So what's going to win out here? Will the Republicans be able to make history, the real truth, stick? Or will they get away with saying that she was never put in charge of the border? Oh, just wild stuff. I mean, Axios putting up a fact check that she was never border czar. And then people noted that Axios themselves called her a border czar. It really is like 1984 level stuff. The problem for Kamala Harris in the media is that all of this is on video. You know, I mean, she ran for president in 2019 and she ran to the left of most of the other candidates. Um, you know, so, you know, what are you going to believe the media or your lying eyes? Um, so I, it really is a, a greatest hits catalog of everything on video, all of this stuff. So, I mean, I, I don't think the media's game is going to work, but they're certainly going to try. <laughs> right. They really are. I mean, and you saw like how aggressively Pete Buttigieg, the transportation secretary, defended her on Fox News yesterday, saying that's not true. And it's the Republicans fault because they wouldn't pass the legislation from the spring. I mean, I don't know. I'm waiting to see how the Trump campaign responds to all of this. Yeah, I mean, the record of Biden's administration at the border is crystal clear. And I don't think any voter, whether you like Donald Trump or not, is confused on what Donald Trump would do on the border. So ultimately, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a contrast. Voters are going to look at the choice on border policy and immigration between what Donald Trump did when he was president and what this administration did when Joe Biden was president, you know, and so. So it's not theoretical anymore. It's not like 2020 where Joe Biden was like, I'm just going to, you know, unite the country. Now the records are there. Yeah, you can weigh them. Crystal clear. I see. Let me ask you this. There's a big story in the New York Times today, but they're not the only ones writing about it. And this is the idea that there is an increasing gender gap, especially between younger men and younger women when it comes to politics. And on the digital front, I've, I've thought for many months that the Trump campaign's digital campaign was excellent. But it felt to me over the weekend, I was like, wow, is the Kamala Harris team catching up quickly? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if this is a hype machine, sort of like the mm-hmm. media's hype machine, if it's that or if it's if it's a real thing. I mean, I certainly look at the polls and see that the gender gap exists. I mean, I think it's incumbent on the Trump campaign uh, to get out there with, um, you know, testimonials from real people, suburban moms, um, you know, Women impacted by, um, you know, all of the Title IX stuff and and the women's sports stuff. Yep. You know, the Riley Gaineses of the world, people like that, who can talk to this on terms um, where where they're trusted. You know, um, so I, I think that's incumbent on on the on the Trump campaign. Um, but those, I mean, there certainly is a, is a gender gap. All right, Michael, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. And we're back with more Perino on politics. Wanted to ask you about Vice President Harris and what you think about a vice presidential choice. Does it matter? Does it matter who she picks if if it's from a swing state? Um, And how troubling is it to you? I find it reprehensible that there are groups forming that would be like just white women for Kamala Harris, black men for Kamala Harris. I'm like, what? Why can't you just be for her regardless of who you are in terms of your ethnic identity? 
Yeah, like we used to joke about stuff like this, that they would put people into these sort of categories and then they actually do it. I mean, it's 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 crazy. And they bristle at the, you know, DEI uh, stuff when Republicans say it, but then they go ahead and do it. So, I, I mean, it's bizarre to me. I, I just don't get yeah. it. I mean, people aren't monolithic like that. But what's, um, what's weird is that of all the people that she's looking at, at least that we know of on our, on the short list, are older white guys to be her running mate. I mean, should, should, I'm not offended by that. Would they? Right. Would they be? I, I don't know. Why do we have to be so offended? Yeah. I mean, I don't get it. Uh, I. I mean, look. I mean, a political campaign is a, is a is marketing. It's advertising, and you're selling an idea. There's no reason, you know, Kamala Harris shouldn't have. Um, you know, somebody who's going to burnish her credentials in a place like the Midwest or, you know, somebody like Mark Kelly, who might help her on border issues where, you know, they know that's a weakness of her tenure as vice president. I mean, that's just sort of politics 101. Yeah. So does it matter if she picks a swing state governor? Like, let's say it's Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania or uh, Roy Cooper of North Carolina. I think it has to help by default because their numbers are better than hers in yeah. those states. You that's know? a, good, I that's mean, a like, great point. You know, even even if it is on the on the margin, I mean, Josh Shapiro has fantastic numbers in Pennsylvania. You know, as a Republican, I really <laughs> don't want it to be him. But I do have to wonder if there's a little calculation from some of these folks with great numbers who come from these swing states who look who may be looking ahead to 2028 and an opportunity to run as themselves rather than you know, this 100-day sprint, picking up the pieces from Joe Biden. I think a person like like Josh Shapiro or with a really bright future, I think, in the Democratic Party probably takes a pass. You know, I think like a Roy Cooper or like a Mark Kelly probably makes a lot more sense because, I, well, number one, I think they'd have a hard time winning a Democratic primary for president. Um you know, based on, on their more own. moderate positions. Yeah. And, 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 and they're, they're, they're older. Um, so I think those probably make, make more sense uh, for her, but we'll see. Has her ascendancy helped or hurt the Democrats down ballot in this house or the Senate? And are those two different things? They are kind of two different things because, you know, Democrats have so many incumbents, right? So like, you know, an incumbent senator like a Bob Casey, he's got his own brand, you know, independent of um, Kamala Harris or Joe Biden, just from, you know, the fact that he's been around and also his daddy was in politics. You know, so so those folks benefit from having their, their own brand and it has a more durability, I would say. Um, and if you look at all of those Senate polls, you, you'll see the Democratic Senate candidates outperforming Kamala Harris. Um, you know, but that that's going to change as the environment gets nationalized here in the fall. People come back from Labor Day and kids are back in school. Um, so it remains to be seen how durable some of those things are. Um, I remember people in 2016 saying how durable Evan Bayh's brand was in huh. Indiana when he jumped into that race late. And I worked on that campaign for Todd Young. And then we totally disassembled him over the course of the summer and fall. Yeah, people might not remember and, you know, Evan Bayh. He was a governor of Indiana. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, and, and a senator. And a yeah. senator. And then he, he resigned and he had $10 million in his campaign account that he basically sat on, you know, for the last uh, for the next six years. And then he jumped in the race and sort of similar the presidential, there was a lot of like behind the scenes work with the Democratic Party. They had actually nominated Baron Hill and then pushed him to side of the Democratic Central Committee in Indiana. In Indiana basically selected Evan Bayh as their nom- nominee after the primary. It was fascinating. Um, on the Republican side of things, J.D. Vance, um, there's re- articles that I remember reading from other Republicans in the past whenever a Republican like Trump, when he picked Pence, there was so much media about how that was a terrible pick because it was too right wing, et cetera. Um, J.D. Vance is kind of getting a similar treatment in the past week. Do you think that will settle down? I don't know. I mean, I feel like the media, I, they had this giant therapy session about Joe Biden for so long. And they're so relieved that the problem for them got solved that I think they're sort of just back to being activists. Um, and, you know, I mean, like we said earlier, talking about how they've changed articles that they previously wrote to support Kamala Harris's current position, not her past position. 
I think that's going to continue. That's just sort of the nature of presidential politics. But he's, I mean, he's a tough guy. I mean, this mm-hmm. guy was a Marine, um, successful business, and United States Senator. I don't think he'll have any problem defending his record. What do you think J.D. Vance could do right now to help President Trump the most as he deals with a media that is um, very happy with Kamala Harris? Talk to real voters, barnstorm uh, across the Rust Belt, the blue wall that is, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. That's ultimately going to decide whether Donald Trump uh, is president of the United States again. You know, I mean, we, we need to do well in Arizona and Georgia. Don't get me wrong. But we we won't get to victory without one of the three of those. But states. Kamala Harris and can't get to victory without some of the working class Rust Belt voters either. Right. And I'm finding it. I, I, yeah. I'm going to be interested to watch how she tries to approach them. Yeah, I mean, she has to. Um, back again to our earlier discussion about those cohorts of voters she does better with, you know, younger voters and, and African-American voters. She does worse with independent-leaning Republicans in the suburbs and does worse with rural voters than, than Joe Biden. Um, you know, so I think, you know, a lot of people are wondering, you know, if, if Kamala Harris would have been the nominee, would he still have picked J.D. Vance as his running mate? I think Trump still would have done it because... That pathway is the pathway to victory. And J.D. Vance is, you know, he grew up in Appalachia and Mm -hmm. his family moved to Ohio. Mm -hmm. And he can speak to those voters in the same way that Donald Trump does. And I think that's going to be a key to victory. Oh, that's so interesting. All right. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Perino on Politics. Michael, this is where I ask my smart friends, what are you paying attention to in the race right now or for the next month that I might be missing? Uh, Well, a couple of things. So number one, there's been a lot of conversation in this uh, presidential cycle about the double haters. Mm-hmm. You know, have you heard these double haters? Yeah, right? I call people them the double Trump. dismayed because I don't think they're hateful people. <laughs> but yes, I, we know what yeah. you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they didn't like Joe Biden. They didn't like Donald Trump. And I'm curious um, how they react to Kamala Harris. Right. And I think her ceiling is higher with them. She has a chance to do better with them than than Joe Biden. But I think the profile of these voters really are more independent uh, suburban voters and the sort of people I think are going to be shocked by the record of Kamala Harris. So, I mean, that's sort of the thing I'm going to be following the trend lines on, you know, ahead of the the DNC. And then the other thing is the DNC itself. Like, is it going to be a love fest? I don't know. You know, I mean, there are huge swaths of the Democratic primary electorate who are still very angry at the Biden administration um on things like gaza and student loans and things like that and i mean anything could happen you know i mean it could be unity it could be disunity so i'm you know i got my popcorn (laughs) will ruthless go to the dnc oh gosh no 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 i don't want to get in any fights with anyone um you're a lover not a fighter yeah 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 i don't we don't really do the provocative stuff uh, maybe, maybe one day if I got what's like a that game you guys? And a helmet. What's that game you guys play? Is is it King of the Hill? Mm-hmm. Okay, wait. How, Hill? How do, I, 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 so I listened last week and I was confused. How does it? What is the game? How does it work? How do you win? Okay, so King of the Hill is where there's two contestants and they select a champion for the week. And King of the Hill is all uh, you know former Republicans who became Democrats in the era of Donald Trump. Ah, okay. And it's basic. Yeah, it's basically a game where we um, challenge our co-hosts to find somebody who has entirely debased themselves and all what they previously stood for and believed in the name of becoming, um, you know, uh, one of the most treasured commodities in media. And you know this is is former Republican turned Democrat. (laughs) Um, So, you know, the Jen Rubens of the world. We had Michael Steele on the game last week. He was a former RNC chairman, you know? And and so it's just, we just find it very funny, the ideological pretzels that former Republicans will put themselves in, you know, for a hit on MSNBC. We really enjoy it. Well, it's a, you, you have a great <laughs> podcast, and you are such a wise, level-headed person and generous with your time. Thanks for coming on Perino on Politics. Thank you. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.